Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Likeable Science is about all about why you should care about science, why you should relate to science, why you should embrace science. Science should not be isolated and something kept off in distant laboratories done by strange scientists. Science is something we should all be involved with every day. Here to help me talk about uh, that today is Dr. Mary Hagedorn. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Ethan. Mary, Mary is coming back after about four years ago. Yep. I think you were on one of my very early shows. Yep. So it's very nice to see you. Pleasure. Uh, Mary has been working on coral reproduction for something like 14, 15 years now. It's uh, and made tremendous strides. Run, runs now some of the world's largest cryopreservation facilities for coral eggs, coral sperm, and coral embryos, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's good stuff. So. You know, a lot of people are going to say corals are yeah, just sort of under the water. Why should we care about them? You know? So coral reefs do a lot for us, and, and I think the major take-home message is without coral, um, life on Earth would not be sustained. So they're really important for us to survive as, as a species, as a, as a population, as a group on Earth. So coral and humans, humans should like coral because they help them survive. And, so you know, make that link, if you would. Yeah, yeah. So some of the things that um, coral help us with is uh, they're one of the oldest ecosystems on the planet, and one quarter of all life that lives in the ocean at some point lives on a coral reef. Uh -huh. they, so a, a vast nursery ground, um, and they also help us think of the tsunamis we have had over the last five, five or so years. They protect cities and coastlines because they take the impacts of the waves before our city or our home. And certainly, I've been grateful for those coral reefs on the Kaneohe side who have taken those impacts of the tsunamis that have um, come to Hawaii. They also provide us with um, novel sources of pharmaceuticals, and uh, some of that is still in, very much in research. But when you think about uh, uh, the, the, anti, um, the resistant antibacterial uh, strains, um, corals may provide us with new types of pharmaceuticals that will help with those kinds of things. And uh, moreover, they provide uh, livelihood for lots of people on Earth. O almost one billion people on Earth depend on cor coral reefs and the fish that, that they house for their major source of protein, like in the Pacific here. Mm. And then finally, um, and I'm not sure if I said this, I might have already, but excuse me if I'm repeating myself, about 350, they, they, they add about 350 million, sorry, billion <laughs> dollars to the economy every year. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so it's, it's quite substantial. Yeah in terms of tourism and snorkeling and just, you know, um, they, right. they really help us. Yeah, the Im impacts on many, many different ways. Exactly. That's, 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 exactly. that's fascinating to see. And of course now corals face a lot of threats these days, right? I mean, the ocean temperature is getting warmer, which is bad for corals. The ocean is getting more acidic, which is bad for corals. The ocean is getting more polluted, which is bad for corals, right? right? And, and so is this sort of what, I mean, is this what helped sort of get you involved in this whole business of looking at coral reproduction? Yes, so um, I, back when I started, I, I, I understood that we were overusing, um, that we were overusing um, fossil fuels. And by overusing fossil fuels, we were putting CO2 in the atmosphere and warming our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. 14 years ago, it wasn't quite as much in the, in the public uh, mind as it right. is today, but it was in the literature, the scientific literature. Right. There was no question that that we were warming our ocean and causing more acidity to our ocean. Now, this dual um, action of warming our ocean and overuse of fossil fuels is causing stress for coral. Right. So, anytime you cause stress for any living organism, think think of humans, and you know when you get too busy at work or wherever at school, and you just don't, are not eating right or not exercising right. You get stressed, right. and you can easily get a, catch a cold or any other kind of sort of disease that's floating around. It's, it's often easy to get sick, and right. it's the same for coral as well because they are animals. Um, they are not rocks, right. and they are not plants. Right, yeah. <laughs> now, <Common> misconception. Right? <laughs> well, they have those qualities, right. you know. So just like we have skeleton in our in our, our body, like in my hand, mm -hmm. 
which is very hard and rock-like, they produce their own skeleton. Right. And um, they also have algae that live inside their cells, which are plants. So mm -hmm. you could, it's easy to see where people could get confused that they might be a plant or they might be a rock, mm -hmm. but they're really living organisms, they're animals, right. and they reproduce. Right. And that's really what, what you've made the, the focus of your work over the Correct. last years, because they reproduce the way animals typically do. Some produce sperm, some produce eggs. These meet up, happy, happy, they form a little embryo, and, and that grows and at some point drifts around or swims around, settles somewhere, and new coral appears. Exactly, right. exactly, exactly. And, but this is not was not well studied, certainly 15 years ago, right? And this whole um, process was not yeah, well understood. I mean, it, it, you're right in, one, in some respect that the first time people even understood that coral had, did these mass spawnings, was in, in, eight, in 1985. Okay. So, you know, it, it, it's relatively, with any right. quotes, relatively recent that we understand that coral reproduce and how they reproduce. But I think what's come more recently, say in the last five to seven years, is the effect of these, these changes to the ocean and how it's affecting, dramatically affecting mm -hmm. reproduction. Because um, as the oceans are warming, we get these things called bleaching events. Right. And it's a stressful event which causes the algae that lives inside the coral. Now, these algaes are critical mm -hmm. for sustaining the, al the coral's life because mm -hmm. the algae takes sunlight and, the, and it produces sugars, and it passes those sugars to the coral. So they basically feed right. the coral. And, and um, coral, in turn, protects the algae. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a mutualistic. Exactly. Um, and we call that symbiosis. Right. And um, the, um, so when the coral gets stressed, um, what happens is that the symbiodinium start going through, it's called oxidative stress, and they are often, they go through a series of physiological events that damages their photosynthesis and they leave or get expelled by the coral. Um, and so then the coral look bleached. Um, and I'll, I'll just use this example here. Right. Um, so and that's, this, is a, this is a 3D printed coral, but it looks very white. And it's really just showing what a coral model might, might look like. <laughs> And so when coral bleach, they have this very white look to them because we're looking through their tissue, kind of like the, you know, the invisible man, that's that right. model you put together when you're right. a kid. You could look through their, their, their skin or their, and you can see their skeleton. Right. And so um, in 2014 and 15, we had a major bleaching events here in, in Hawaii. And many people would stop me and go, what is wrong with the coral? Because they could see from their cars as they mm -hmm. drove over H3 or, you know, in Kailua or wherever it might be, they could see that the corals were white. It was very clear that they were white, and, and people were very disturbed by this change in the coral. So this bleaching event, these bleaching events are becoming much more common around the world, um, and they're driven by the overuse of fossil fuels and the CO2 in our atmosphere. And um, as we get more and more bleaching events, it's, it's impacting, it's stressing the coral, and it's impacting the reproduction. So they're not reproducing as they did, say, 20 or even 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they reproduce uh, very sort of synchronously, right? They, they all, uh, some very odd combination of tides, moon, time of day, they, they all know that this is the perfect time, and they all release sperm and release eggs in, in one mass, uh, which, of course, they sort of have to do. It's a big ocean, right? If you just dribbled them out, they'd never find each other, right? No, that's, that's very right, right. Ethan. The, um, I think the thing that's very fascinating about uh, the coral invertebrates in particular is they, obviously, they can't move. So many animals synchronize by moving together. They, mm -hmm. they can go to one spot or something like that, migrate. Um, but coral can't do that. And um, they have, there's only about 10 cells within a coral body, <laughs> but, but they have proteins that are very similar to the proteins that are in our eye. And so they can take um, moonlight and sunlight and process the, the change in the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to warming waters, which happens in the summer, the, 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 the um, sun and the moon becomes very important to their circadian rhythm. And, mm -hmm. and that means we have a clock, it's called right. a circadian clock. All animals have a circadian right. clock, it's in their DNA. Right. And um, so they synchronize their spawning based on this sun and the moon, temperature, and their circadian clock. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's critical, and of course, yeah, as you say, they're warming the oceans, they're being more stressed, there are a, a number of things that could desynchronize that would make it harder for them to, to exactly. sync. So, um, then wh when did you get this sort of, this idea that the, the way to conserve them, and maybe to preserve the species, was, was to sort of, to gather the sperm, gather the eggs, gather the embryos? 
So um, what, what I do, just the most simply, um, sim simple way to think about it is I use human fertility techniques, exactly the same things. Like if you were, you were your family member would go to a, you know, a clinic, um, uh, the, the sorts of questions, the sorts of cells, the sorts of approaches that, that you would experience there are exactly the same thing that we do with coral. So the coral, we know when the coral are going to spawn. So our next spawn here in Hawaii is going to be the night of June 14th at 9 p.m. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're welcome to come. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so uh, here in Hawaii, the corals are very synchronized. And so we can predict when they're going to spawn and prepare for that. Mm -hmm. And um, there are many ways we do that. We can either go out and collect a small sample and bring it into our our, our, our flow through water sea, sea, our sea water system, or we can um, uh, put nets over the coral and collect the, um, the material that way. Now, most many corals produce these things called egg sperm bundles, and, and I'll use my hands here a little bit. So think of it as a small ball of fat okay. <laughs> with many different eggs, like some, somewhere between 10 and 20, depending on the species. And in the center of that ball of eggs is a sperm packet. And um, so corals are hermaphrodites, meaning they can produce either sperm or eggs. So they okay. have ovaries and testes. Okay. And um, they package that egg sperm bundle up about two days or a day before they're about to spawn. And then at the time of spawning, they release these and they gently flow, um, rise to the, in, in the water column to the surface. And we often collect them in kayaks and we scoop them off the surface. Or as I said, we can go ahead of time and get small fragments and bring them into our water tables. Wow, I hadn't realized that. So are they doing, are they primarily self-fertilizing then or, or do they break apart then and, and Yeah, mix? that's a really good question. Some species do, not many do, but those are the pioneering species. So species that go into new environments, some of those can self-fertilize, sure. but most do not. Okay. And so they have to break apart. The eggs have to hydrate or get expand and get ready for fertilization, and the sperm has to swim away and find a near neighbor. Okay. Huh. Wow. It's, it's, it is. It's very, it's, very complicated. It is, it is, it is complicated. No. <laughs> and of course, it, this is not just a Hawaiian problem, right? This is in the Caribbean. This is around Australia. It's, it's basically all tropical islands basically have. All over the world. It's yeah. a, it is a global issue. And it's pretty bad everywhere, right? Um, you know, some places are better than others. Right. Um, like if you think about some of the troubles that the Great Barrier Reef has recently experienced in the 2016 bleaching event, one third of the northern Great Barrier Reef died, just died. They, they didn't bleach, they died. They bleached and then died. Wow. Just because you bleach doesn't mean you die. You right. can recover if you get your algae back again. Right. Um, and, um, but the southern Great Barrier Reef is still in good shape and right. there's areas there that still have a lot of diversity. And, and hopefully the Northern Great Barrier Reef will recover. Um, but I think that was a huge wake up call for many biologists, coral biologists in particular um, uh, in Australia to think that so much of the Great Barrier Reef could just die in just short order. Right, right. I, th I think there's some reefs around parts of Palau that are, that are still doing quite well, even mm -hmm. though the water has warmed. So there's obviously a lot of unknowns here still. Exactly, and I, th I think that's, a, that, that's the thing that gives me hope is that we can go ahead and start, you know, cryopreserving and archiving some of this material. But we also want to, we also want to save save it for the near future. So that, say, you do have something like the Great Barrier Reef has a problem, we could then use our frozen sperm and help bring those populations back again. And um, you know, and in the near future, we hope to do th this thing called assisted gene migration, where we take, say, sperm from Palau and perhaps. You know, and this is—we're not doing this right now, but it's something that we could do. We could take our frozen sperm from the the, the 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 corals in Palau that are doing quite well, and perhaps bring them to another area and cross fertilize them. Oh, wow! So we have we have the ability to move around the really robust genes that you know from the corals who are doing well. We have the capacity to do to move it around the world. The question is, do people want to do that? Is there permitting to do that? And, and is it allowed? So we have, the, we have the capacity, we just don't, we're just not doing that right now. And when we come back, we're gonna dig in much more deeply into this, what can, what can we do, what are we doing to, to bring corals back? Uh, right now we're gonna take a little break. I'm Ethan Allen, Mary Hagedorn is with me here in the Think Tech studios. We're talking about reef reproduction and re re restoration. And um, we'll be back in one minute. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at two o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's 
Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. And we're back here on um, Linkable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Dr. Ma Mary Hagedorn has joined me, your host, Ethan Allen of Linkable Science, uh, here in the Think Tech Studios. And we're talking about coral reefs and coral reproduction and coral reef regeneration, basically. And we were talking the first half of the show about how coral reefs are in big trouble worldwide. They've been hit by sort of the triple whammy of rising temperatures, uh, increasing acidity, and some pollution, all of which stress the corals and in inhibit uh, their reproduction. Mary has gathered up sperm and eggs and embryos from many types of coral in many places and stuffed them in super cold uh, freezers, basically, where she can actually pull them back out and make voila, coral again, right? But uh, you, you're doing more stuff than that, right, really, even now, right? So let me just briefly summarize this, what you just sure. said. We have over um, 20 species of coral now that, um, many of them from the Great Barrier Reef, that we've frozen the sperm for. Um, and we have actually many, many samples from, from those. Th those live in Taronga Zoo in Australia. And then um, we have uh, sperm from the Caribbean and from Hawaii that are, um, live or are, are stored at USDA in, in uh, Fort Collins. Um, the, the, in addition now, we're, we're, st we're starting to cryopreserve a variety of different types of material. Um, we're working on larvae. Eggs are still difficult, but okay. we're going to try them this summer. Okay. Um, and we have new tech, we have some very high tech ways of um, freezing them and thawing them. We actually use lasers to thaw them super fast, like at millions of degrees per minute, because one of the things ca that can really damage large tissue, like an embryo is large, a human embryo is, is say, less than a grain of sand. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a coral a coral embryo is more like a, a tapioca bead. Um, so they're, they're, they're largely different in, in volume and size. Mm -hmm. And so that makes a difference in terms of their physics and how water and um, the antifreeze that we need to um, get into them moves in and out. And so, um, uh, so we worked on larvae first because that was easier and we'll try eggs this summer. But one of the things that can happen when you're freezing something is that an ice crystal can form inside or many ice right. crystals. And that can tear the, the material apart. We do this all the time in our at home. Uh, if you don't cover your ice cream appro appropriately, you'll get big ice crystals right. growing, and it tastes terrible. We mm -hmm. call it freezer burn, but it's really those big ice crystals that are that are growing, and that can happen in cryopreserved material as well. And you don't want that. So, right. the, if by by using lasers and warming them, at, we warm them at four million degrees per minute. <laughs> it's, okay. it's very fast. <laughs> not, so. not very long in my <laughs> Yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, we were able to then stop the, there's some ice crystals there, but we stopped them from growing. So they just, mm -hmm. they just go into stasis, which is perfect. And then the material is perfect. Um, so in addition, um, and I want to I wanna point out um, this show and tell I brought, mm -hmm. um, there's a small, a small piece of coral on a silver pin um, outside the glass there. And um, these are, we call them coral microfragments. They're dead. They're, it's just the skeleton that you're looking at right now. Um, but what we do is we cut them this small, and then we allow them to recover. They heal over. And then we're doing a number of experiments. And our, our goal over the next six months is to get these live, um, so they would look green or green-brown, um, coral microfragments to um, live through our cryopreservation process and to um, come back out and, and be alive. Wow. And there's many ways we, can, we know that they're alive. They, they actually, um, coral are, um, have tentacles. If you look at them very carefully, you can see their tentacles waving in the air. Mm -hmm. And actually we use behavior more than anything else to, to show wow. that the coral are alive. We look to see if they're waving sure. their tentacles around. Wow. <laughs> so you, you, you could actually, in theory, freeze 
pieces of coral of that, of that size and, right. and then bring them back to life. Hopefully, so that's the goal. More, more adult corals. Yeah. yeah okay. And so then the, 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 the thing about, the, about the, the, the difficult things about working on coral reproduction is you only have about two nights a year that you can work on this. And so, and it's only like about four hours each night. So you have eight hours to do all of the work oh. that you want to do. And um, in Hawaii, it's a little bit longer because we have coral reproduction more extended. The Great Barrier Reef, it's not. It's mm -hmm. just one and done, basically. Oh. But um, with these microfragments here that we have um, in front of us, we could potentially work almost throughout the year because mm -hmm. we could go, we, we actually take a tiny little micro dremel, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like dent dental tools, and we just take a tiny little chip out of the coral. We don't damage it at mm -hmm. all. And we put them on those silver pins and we um, stick them um, on uh, um, material that raises them above the, uh, above the uh, ground in our water table. And we left them there for about a week, and then, then we start our work on them. Okay. And then with the idea being eventually you essentially re replant that right. on, on some substrate and set that back in the ocean, right. and, and that grows back up into a, a full-size coral again, right? Yeah, there's some, there's some amazing work that's being done by, the, by um, uh, groups in Florida. One in particular is um, a Moat Marine Lab, and they're the ones who really um, have pushed forward this idea of uh, microfragments, mm -hmm. and they can take microfragments and put them in different combinations, like close together, um, and they can grow them so they merge, and uh -huh. they grow much faster, and they they um, reproduce much more quickly. Oh, interesting. So, they like like being with another. There's a, a critical mass. Yeah, so it's, it's a way to accelerate the growth yeah. of the of the coral. So if we can freeze these, um, we think it's going to be transformative in terms of the way we can conserve reefs around the world. Excellent, because that, that uh, I mean, I recall when, uh, back in 2011, you were saying you thought the coral reefs were in grave danger some three or four decades out, and the estimates have only sort of gone down from there, right? So Yeah, you know, I, I guess I'm a little more, I don't know, I'm a, a little more patient now, mm -hmm. I'm a little more hopeful. I think there are, um, Places in the world, like you mentioned Palau, where corals are adapting. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm hoping that people are really, they're waking up about coral, and I think they would like to do something about it. And so I'm hopeful. Okay. Well, no, that's great. I mean, this, you, you've got to have hope to do this kind of work, <laughs> yeah, right? right? And it's, it's, it's critical stuff because, again, of the key role that these reefs play in life cycles of fish, marine invertebrates everything that the fish eat. So yeah, if coral reefs collapse and the fisheries collapse and people's livelihoods collapse and, and then people collapse, right? And, well, one thing we know uh, for sure is that hunger will increase. If yeah. reefs start to fail, hunger right. will increase around the world. Um, and that's not, a good, that's not a good scenario at all. No, no, I mean, already the, the uh, major fisheries in, around the globe, most of them are already being unsustainably fished and overfished yes. and in decline. Yes. And it's yes. only projected to get, to get worse, as I understand it. Absolutely. So all the more reason that we need to give the coral every every bit of a helping hand we can. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, do you have a, a set goal here? Are you are you, are you going to, you know, recolonize <laughs> the Great Barrier Reef? Or um, I do have a goal. And, mm -hmm. and so if this um, these microfragments and other types of material that we are working on are successful. Um, we know the sperm is successful, we know the larvae is successful, but it's being successful in the lab and then being able to make that applicable for restoration. So it's a very big difference between that. So there's some uh, spin up that you have to do to go from sort of a small scale to large scale. Right. So we have to be engaged with that. Um, but I would very much like to have teams that went around the world in every ocean that could engage in some kind of, con of, of conservation and cryopreservation for coral and be banking them in every ocean. So there's not, the unfortunate thing is we don't have uh, repositories in every ocean that mm -hmm. material can go to. And uh, they're, they're, the permitting in some countries is, is very difficult now. They don't want people taking genetic material out of the country, which is completely understandable right. because of bio, bio piracy. Um, but I'm hoping that in the future that they'll make exceptions for science because we aren't making any money off right. of it and we're there to help them and, ha and maintain their genetic resources. Right, and uh, since the oceans a few decades from now are likely to be a different place, you actually probably need a different mix of types of corals to have some new hybrid species that has the desired characteristics of being acid tolerant, 
heat tolerant, plastic tolerant. Exactly. And some of that's happening already. Right, you know, right. we're starting to see a lot of hybridizations in the oceans. I mean, I, I was recently... Natural hybrid, hybridizations? Or yeah, oh. yeah. I mean, I was... I mean, there's one, there's a very famous one in the Caribbean. It's called Acropora prolifera. It's, it started hybridizing in the 50s. Huh. So the, the Caribbean has been ahead of the game here, um, for good or for bad. But also, I was in Marea recently, and there was just so many different, I just had to call them a cropper complex. Um, and a cropper is the major uh, species, or, or genus, sorry, that um, are reef building. Mm -hmm. And the, you couldn't tell one species from the other because they just were so mixed. Huh. And you know, maybe a good systematist who really did this for their, their life could tell, but they just looked so similar. Huh. Interesting, interesting. Well, it's great to know that, yeah. that, that the Mother Nature herself is actually yeah. doing some of this work yeah. for you, right? Yeah, she's taking a hand right. way ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's also most excellent and valuable that, that you're doing this. And, and, and sort of wrapping around back to, to our, our starting comments, it's, this is, I mean, really, there's in some sense no more important work to be done, right? I mean, if for it, me, if, if there's it, many important yeah. work to be done, but as a marine biologist, for oh, me, there's right. There's, and, uh, if the quarries do fall apart, yes, and the oceans are in big trouble, basically, as we know them. Yeah. And, and since uh, what one out of every two breaths we hate come from the algae in the oceans, uh, yeah, and we don't really know how that how the coral reefs interact with algae, yeah. so that. You know, our oxygen could be threatened. We don't yeah. know the answer. You right. Know? Yeah, you're, you're messing with a very big, complex system, yes. and if you pull enough parts of it yes. out, does everything else yes. crash? Yeah, I, I, I kind of liken it to the 2008, you know, financial crash in the United States. It just rippled across the globe. You yeah, know? yeah, and this this could could conceivably do a very similar thing. Yeah. Wow. We'll hope it, we hope it doesn't. Yeah, we hope it doesn't. <laughs> and due to good people like yourself, it, it's looking like maybe maybe there's there's hope. I hope so. All right. <laughs> I want now before we wrap up here, I, I'm going to take a, a side step here and ask you a completely off the wall question. Nothing to do with coral at all. Okay. But if you could have the superpower of either mm. flying or being invisible, which would you choose and why? Oh yeah, that's a that's a good one. Um, I think I would choose being invisible. Because I, I think that that allows you to, to go places and understand things that you wouldn't necessarily be able. I can fly on a plane, right? Uh -huh. But I can't be invisible. So I, I think I would choose being invisible um, just to increase the amount of understanding that I had, both politically, politically mostly. So Because many things are said in confidence. And uh -huh. um, I would obviously be eavesdropping. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think okay. we understand complex things when we uh, are engaged in conversations and being Invisible would be a good one. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mary. Mary Hagedorn is uh, from the Smithsonian. Uh, is here. Uh, has been telling us all about coral and, and what she's doing with the amazing work on coral reproduction and restoration of coral reefs. Thank you so much. I look forward to talking to you in a few more years, and we'll uh, we'll see where things are going. Thank you so much, Ethan. And I hope you will come back and join us next week on Likeable Science. <laughs> <laughs>